Google. Um, ah, yes, we're doing Google Hangout for uh, our remote participants, and I would like to welcome them and the rest of uh, and all of you here in real life uh, to scale and granularity in archaeological data management. Um, this is a, a session that is largely, but not entirely, uh, composed of uh, representatives from the Federated, Inf uh, Federated Archaeological Information Management System project based at UNSW, uh, where we just finished a couple of years of, um, of archaeological IT development, and are happy to say you won't be able to get rid of us too easily. We're around for another two years, uh, because we have the happy news that uh, we have won an ARC lead grant uh, that will keep us going. So uh, we also have some other non-FAMES uh, people here to broaden out the perspective on things. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, announce, uh, I'll, I'll introduce our first uh, presenter, Robert uh, Hopped. Um, and I'll just turn it, I won't, uh, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> so. um, hi, I got uh, two issues. One is I tend to go off on tangents, so I'm going to try and stick to my script. Uh, second one is um, my PowerPoint. Uh, the PC didn't like my Mac PowerPoint, so I'm going to play back a video. I'm going to try and stop the video while I'm talking, so this is going to be interesting. Um, let's see if it's going to play the next slide. Yay! <laughs> Um, all right, in the next few minutes, um, I want to talk to you about the development of a proof of concept design for heritage content, content management um, and resource management system developed for rock art uh, utilizing open source systems. To give you a little bit of a background about, um, without uh, giving too much detail, uh, currently no centralized global or national heritage database uh, exists. Um, UNESCO, GHN, and projects like FAMES are, are working on centralizing uh, heritage data, but at the moment there's no there's no such thing as a as a centralized hub for heritage. Uh, the same uh, for rock art. There's no central database for rock art. Um, no standards, more importantly, for recording and archiving heritage data or rock art data exist. Um, the ISO is working on this, but again, there's no standards. Uh, due to a lack of appropriate heritage management systems, important heritage information is being lost on a daily basis, um, which was uh, revealed, for example, in the latest uh, State of the Environment reports. Um, so the aim of this uh, project is to centralize data. Um, the objectives, uh, there are three main objectives. Um, the first one is assist with curating and presenting, promoting rock art in a centralized database. The idea is to create a hub which users um, and administrators of other online databases can connect to without actually giving up their own existing system. So it's kind of like you set up a Facebook account and people can actually log into it and you can link back to your own database. But at the same time, um, there's also an integrated CMS which uh, users are also uh, free to use. Uh, secondly, uh, to offer a platform for researchers, um, communities, but also uh, the general public. And the idea here is to make uh, data more accessible through uh, visualizing complex data sets. Uh, lastly, the pro uh, project explores the use of new technologies uh, to develop uh, or find new ways uh, to look at rock art. Right. Um, the methodology, uh, the project's developed in three phases. Phase one is the uh, oh, is a, a review of uh, existing heritage platforms from international forums, uh, international platforms to uh, state uh, reporting systems. Um, second phase is the uh, design of a proof of concept. And the third phase will be a rollout with an agile development approach um, based on PMII. Uh, with a frequent quarterly uh, review of the database system. Um, open source tools. Uh, so for the development of this um, proof of concept and the, the first prototype, we looked at different uh, platforms. Uh, one was DBSpace, which is a popular library system uh, used by a lot of libraries, um, university libraries around the world. Uh, Drupal. Um, is another um, 
MySQL database uh, and content management system, which is used, for example, by Stanford University or MIT Lab, um, or the, I don't know if you're fam familiar with the Mokutu Heritage database, they're also using Drupal. Um, what we're actually using is uh, WordPress. Sounds funny, but the um, core database of WordPress is actually highly flexible. And um, for the proof uh, of concept design and for the prototype, it was actually sufficient. A um, couple of features that we looked at was uh, the use of uh, WordPress as a content management system, multimedia features, spatial temple uh, features, access to metadata, which is really important, uh, social networking capabilities, etc. Um, another element that we looked at was uh, quality assurance. So we uh, actually looked at, as I mentioned earlier, international uh, needs, for example, UNESCO reporting, but also state um, and national reporting, for example, to SUPAC and so on. Um, the entire database is actually uh, working with the SIDOC documentation, uh, which is a uh, ISO guide uh, for heritage platforms. All right. So this is pretty much what the database looks looks like. Um, there's uh, three different hierarch uh, hierarchy levels. The first one is a collection. The collection um, level is pretty much just a hub. Like I said, it's like your Facebook web page, um, where anybody can actually set up a profile and link back to your own database. At the moment, there's about 250 uh, databases linked to this collection uh, level. Um, and then within each collection level, you can actually then whether upload um, uh, or utilize the, the integrated CMS, um, <clears throat> or you can just link back to your own, uh, own database. So the integrated one uh, includes a heritage place level, which a heritage place is, for example, um, Kakadu Park. Then the heritage site would be, for example, a particular site within Kakadu Park. <clears throat> and then lastly, we have the item level, uh, which can record, uh, for example, obviously rock art data, but also artifacts or um, stories. This is where the video starts playing. So um, just want to <coughs> quickly give you an overview of the uh, database itself. So this is the collection level we're looking at at the moment. As I mentioned, there's 250 databases in there at the moment. They're categorized in uh, four different categories. So this is the collection level again. <clears throat> we have international. These are collections that um, uh, have uh, more than just one database, uh, for example, uh, across continents or across countries. Regional are usually uh, databases collected within uh, one continent. Local are just particular places. And then there's obviously UNESCO databases in as well. Um, you can find um, your search as well. Uh, on the on the map, you get a little preview, so you can click on the uh, on the uh, existing collection. You get a preview of the collection. If you click on the uh, collection, uh, we can see the content of each collection. So this gives us basic description about existing databases. Um, we record different uh, different types of values in here. Uh, for example, the uh, the name classification, so you can actually categorize uh, your collection. Uh, as I said, at the moment, there's international, regional, and local databases. Um, we record temporal data, so you can actually um, uh, have a look how um, these projects, for example, emerged over time, the ideas in the future to actually incorporate um, a time slide bar, so you can actually visualize as well at what time different projects started. Geospatial data, obviously, which is also displayed in the map. Basic description data, it's all searchable. Um, so you can actually find content for particular um, entries, contact information, and uh, references for each uh, entry. If we look at uh, the heritage places or the heritage sites, um, without going too much into detail, because like I said, I'll go off on tangents and we'll be here tonight. Um, the basic information that's pretty much recorded uh, in here consists of, again, the SIDOC documentation. The, we use the guide here for entity, uh, entities and attributes. Um, so basic information includes uh, numeric values, 
and you can obviously use uh, use these numeric values to run uh, various calculations as well. Uh, textual values, uh, for example, also for categories. Uh, temporal values, again, we can actually uh, use these for, for temporal searches as well. Uh, geospatial, as you can see in the map um, uh, that we have. <coughs> uh, pointer fields, which link back to uh, entries within the database, so you can find links and data within the database. We have uh, relationship fields uh, linking to external sources. And of course, we have various forms of attachments, for example, publications. Uh, the more interesting attachments are the media attachments. And let's quickly have a look at uh, the media attachments. Uh, the idea here is to get as much, um, uh, as many media formats in there as possible so people can pretty much use it as a repository and just dump data in there. <clears throat> so uh, one element is uh, the geospatial data, which is obviously also displayed in interactive maps. You can switch from satellite to terrain views. Um, it also does um, uh, Google Earth and uh, OpenWebGL. Then uh, apart from that, obviously, we have 2D images. We can at attach photographs, sketches, other documentation. Um, all that is managed in a separate gallery, and each image can get a separate description. Um, further, you can uh, load 3D models into the database. Uh, at the moment, we're using X3DOM, supporting various 3D formats. Um, and we're exploring access to metadata uh, using BIM at the moment, so you can actually extract, uh, for example, um, uh, data it's about the meshes, etc. Uh, each model can actually be annotated. That's for 3D models as well as 2D models. Um, and then that data, again, gets stored in a separate database, so you can actually do uh, feature searches in there. Um, another feature is uh, each entry uh, has a drawing tool, which you can use for mud maps. Uh, sketches, other drawings. Um, what it also allows you to do is you can actually import uh, images out of the database and you can draw on top of that. So you can actually annotate not just by actually selecting a range, but you can also annotate by actually drawing on top of uh, images that you loaded into the database. Um, on the left, there's various drawing tools. So you can pick pens, different colors, etc. And all of that obviously gets stored separately in, in, in the database. Um, other functions include uh, uh, access to metadata. For example, you can display KML and KMZ files, obviously, in the maps. Um, if you have 3D models, you could also display the 3D models uh, in the map. At the moment, there's some issues. Um, this uh, I used Google version 2. At the moment, Google version 3 is the latest version, so there's some compatibility issues at the moment uh, with Google Earth. Uh, another feature includes, so I'm just running through all the different media data that you can use in here. Um, uh, we're using uh, FLAT, which is an X3DOM augmented reality tool. So any, any 3D model that you load into the database, you can actually grab and you can play with it. So um, if you think about it, you could grab a boomerang and throw it. Um, if there's a script to it, it would you know, follow a certain path. Or you could uh, even use uh, two, two 3D models and try and match them together, for example. Um, toys. Uh, let's have a look at the search functions. Uh, the current search functions are pretty much limited um, to uh, content search, but we're also exploring visual, uh, more visual search functions uh, for, for future um, upgrades. Um, so obviously, uh, the main search function in here, um, which is also the easiest one to use, is the map, which contextualizes um, findings as well. So you can actually see uh, how, for example, various databases exist in certain areas. <clears throat> um, further, we have uh, keyword search, text, textual search functions, um, which let you look for categories, descriptions, et cetera. Um, we have um, temporal search functions. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the next upgrade will actually have a slide bar in the map view as well, so you can um, visualize uh, temporal uh, elements as well. Um, obviously, there's various forms of selection tools and multi-selection tools to include and exclude data in your searches. 
Um, the next one is going to be oh, yeah. um, just a quick example. If you look for example, American uh, Indian rock art, um, you'll then be given a list of uh, entries. You can find, um, well, they're also displayed in the map, and you can uh, find previews of each one of these entries um, in the list. Another uh, feature is um, within each entry, you can look um, for various categories within each entry, so it just goes further down in, in, in the uh, in search levels. the disadvantage of using a video. Um, I quickly want to show you one more uh, search feature. Um, there's also a little integrated um, augmented reality search feature. For example, um, if you come across rock art, you can actually use this search feature. It will then give you uh, an automated preview, so you can use this, for example, on, on site. You can also uh, see the database if you click it. Um, you can actually read the back of the database, so this could be quite useful in the field. Um, at the moment, that is actually using a platform called uh, Orasma, which also actually gives you um, access to source code. Um, to wrap it up now, a um, couple more features include uh, uh, searching for publications. So, uh, users in the collection level, they can upload um, various publications, journals, magazines. You can uh, search for these. You can also search for these by date. Uh, another feature would be um, conference search features. So again, on the collection level, the, the, the users can uh, upload various forms of, um, of data and uh, uh, not just rock art related, but also, as I said, conference events. And of course, um, various feeds, like you can see on the, on the left already. Um, you can uh, have Facebook feeds, Twitter feeds, yada, yada, yada. Um, to wrap it up, uh, the main findings here were really that uh, one, WordPress actually works really well as an open source tool. Um, there's a growing community, especially within GIS, um, and uh, it's, it's highly flexible uh, to use, pretty straightforward. There's some issues um, developing online in terms of online security. Just because it's developed online, people actually do know how uh, to access the data. Um, so that's something that needs to be uh, sorted out in the future. The main issue really is actually setting up uh, the database itself and setting up the content management system because there's no guide for um, cultural heritage. Uh, the site of guide is meant for museum collections, so you only want to go with, see some nodding here. Um, so that was really the main issue. The beauty of this is once we actually agree on standards, mm -hmm. you could pretty much plug any system into any other system using APIs and share data across the board, and this is kind of what this, this system is trying to do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robert. Uh, we could take one or two questions. Yes. Hi. Yeah, that's really great. I've got a couple of um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, firstly, um, access restrictions. So I'm assuming yep. that um, users can create a user profile and then upload their data. But um, obviously, a lot of the um, specific GPS locations for sensitive, sites yeah. are sensitive as well as so, the rock art imagery. So, firstly, um, can you create limitations to access yes. to the databases on user profiles? Yep. And secondly, who manages the upkeep of the data? Because um, obviously, there needs to be some sort of so, ongoing technical support so that. So, <laughs> to answer your first question, um, yes, yes, um, uh, user uh, access levels can be managed, obviously, by the administration team. 
but also um, by uh, the user that sets up the collection. So once you set up a profile there, you can actually <clears throat> restrict data to users as well, if that makes sense. So there was the hierarchy levels. Yeah. <clears throat> so within the profile, you can even um, choose to set up a that it can only be seen by certain users. Um, in terms of the content, then that can also be regulated by the person that initially set up the profile. So there, there is a, a system in there. Uh, it still needs to be defined, though, but a little bit better defined. Um, last question was, sorry. Just um, obviously, yeah. Um, so um, is there user role? Uh, oh, the, the role. Um, so the maintenance. So at the moment, the, the maintenance is pretty much, once you set up your profile, you're in charge of actually maintaining your content. Um, it allows, it, it has API features and feed features, so you can actually, you don't even have to access the database. The, da the data gets dumped automatically into the database once you set it up. Um, so much about maintenance, but in the end, the maintenance is put back to the user. So the way that it's set up currently, um, the, the effort that has to be invested in maintaining uh, the, the general system is actually minimal. And then, all right, can you speak the The final question is then um, in terms of copyright and ownership of that information once you move into a centralized database. Um, so, so, so the, the system itself, obviously, everything is uh, developed in open source, um, and it's it's all under uh, under open open source licenses. Um, in terms of the, the, the data that people actually upload, um, that needs to be looked at. There's different issues, there's different countries, different regulations. So. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank, let's all thank Robert for his uh, presentation. We're going to have lots to talk to him about uh, later. But uh, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to invite Penny Crook to come up and uh, talk to us about Data. Data. Repository. Uh, now, how do I? Oh, yes. Let me help you with that. Is your presentation up yet? It's on the desktop. It is on the desktop. It. Okay. Uh, but Brian sent you a message via a mobile device that for anyone who's on Twitter, we are live. So the hashtag for the whole conference is AAA36. <coughs> the hashtag for the whole conference is AAA36, and we also have a hashtag of Fames F A I M S. If anyone is tweeting while we're all here. Brian will be watching it. Points of comparison, yeah. is that you? Screen share is on. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is um, data and sharing data and data sets and all the associated resources that go with that. My main interest in this area um, of doing intersite comparison is within the world of historical archaeology, um, doing assemblage analysis of um, modern cities. This is the telephone dial that some of you may or may not be familiar with, and it's the basic principle that in order to analyse at the large global scale, we have to start with the local. Uh, so this one's based on material in Melbourne, but I've done work in Sydney and, and London and Melbourne. My first exposure to trying to do that kind of work is uh, with the Archaeology of the Modern City project. So that kicked off in 2001. I had nine different databases from seven different sites that I had to um, combine and get into the one system in order to do those comparisons. The uh, result was combining six of those in a standalone access database that um, took a fair bit of time to build. I had to uh, align all the columns, put them all together in the same database, go through, do find some place to uh, normalise the data. It's a term I've now learned. Um, in order to get this data consistent so that I could get on with my analysis work. We got that core data set and built a database on top of it and we shared that at the end of the Modern City project. And the database has since been used for um, a little bit of data entry, which is why we built it, a little bit of um, analysis, but not at the scale that we were doing. And most of it, it's just been used to mine the data to get um, individual references out. We then uh, rebuilt that uh, database to share it in AHAD, the Australasian Historical Archaeological Database, which has now, fingers crossed, and almost been superseded by FAMES. We got our first glimpse of all the AHAD data in uh, FAMES just yesterday. 
Uh, so I'm just going to briefly introduce you to the project. Um, Adela and Sean will be talking more about it later. But um, it's funded by Nectar. We kicked off mid last year and our funding with Nectar runs out this month. Uh, we're committed for maintenance in 2014. Uh, with the in-kind resources, but as Sean mentioned, we have been very fortunate to get some more funding to keep us going for the next two years. The overall approach of FAMES is to build a suite of tools to manage archaeological data from the field to the digital repository. Our end game is producing high quality and reusable data sets, so the kind of munging work that we used to do may not happen in the future, we can't guarantee it of course. We've committed to work with existing tools wherever they've existed, that um, has caused some headaches, it's also um, caused some joy. Everything we've done is open source and um, the whole project has been built on a very consultative model. Uh, we kicked off with a big workshop in August 2012 and we have over 40 um, organisations supporting the project. So the key components that we have developed uh, over the last 18 months are the uh, mobile application, which anyone who's coming to the workshop tomorrow will get to play with in their hands. Do I have a pointer? There's no, there's no. Oh, okay. Uh, no, okay. Um, so the, the mobile application, which is the main uh, component that we've built and you get to play with tomorrow if you've signed up for the uh, workshop. We've also got the we've also got um, editing capacity with Hurist, which is an existing product, and we've built the um, repository based on on Tita and AHAD. So let's take a step back and think about how we get archaeological data in the first place. The first um, step is obviously designing it, it's building your schema, deciding what you're going to record, what your attributes will be, what sort of types they should be, um, whether they're numerical text, vocabularies, defining what the actual vocabularies are, identifying the terms and um, also giving explanations for them and producing any support material that goes with all of that. You then get into the field, uh, you field or lab and you do your primary data collection and that could be on a mobile device, in an access database and an Excel spreadsheet. And then um, during the phase of analysis, when you start to actually use your data for the first time, you might be going back and correcting some errors that have crept into the data set while you were recording. You might be refining your vocabularies and your terms and definitions. Um, so there's a, a bit of interplay in those respects. You'll also be probably creating all new data sets. There'll be analytical ones at a higher level. All of that will fuel your report and um, hopefully generate a publication at the end of that. Um, most of the focus on sharing information in archaeology has always been at this level, at the publication level. Right there, that's been the focus in the past and sometimes also with the report. And if any of you have time, I so wish I could have shown this during the presentation, but it goes on too long. It's on our website, it's a fantastic little um, video um, in three short acts describing the challenge of sharing data and, and um, what happens when people are focused on just sharing publications. So anybody can share their, their data and their data sets. They can do it privately, um, that's often an exclusive process. You need to know the person to find out what they've got to ask them for it. It can be shared on disk drive, email, whatever. Um, because you're creating and sharing the data yourself, you can have any scheme you like. You're not restricted and um, you can define terms however you like. There is a sustainability risk there in that um, file formats you're sharing or the data you're producing may not be standardised and in three years' time you may have it on your uh, academia site, LinkedIn site, you know, you may be sharing it that way and those sites may not be there in three, five or, or ten years. The response to that has been setting up um, digital archives for archaeological data. They enable public discovery. I've asterisked those because some of the data is not always public, but the discovery always should be in a, in a public archive. Archives usually allow custom schema, so however you decided to record the information should be accepted by an archival repository. Everything is to be captured as it was at the end of a project, and that's how it leads to that's how we get duplicates in the system because people may um, need to update things, in which case they resupply the entire data set rather than changing that small piece of information or another researcher might come along and work through that material and will share that result as well. So the archive accepts all but then you get um, lots and lots of data to wade through. New archaeological publication services again allow for public discovery and also some um, protection of, of data. They generally require a fixed schema though, you have to define what you've got before it goes in there. The result of that is you get better data sets and they're edited and curated so they're easier to manipulate. 
And I'm going to talk through some of the um, existing repositories. I'm sure most of you know about the ADS in the UK. It's based in York University. It's the oldest archaeological uh, data repository that we have. A lot of the focus has been on grey literature and reports and they've done um, amazing things there and having a great deal of, of success. It's not known that they um, do also accept data sets and a bunch of other files, uh, GIS, CAD and images. The way they're presented though, they're just shared as files. Um, there's minimal viewing of, of some of those things while you're in their repository and otherwise you download it and do what you will with it. The ADS is a closed system. Um, you have to prepare your metadata in their, in their templates and their Word documents. You fill in all the data and you hand it over and the actual data entry happens in-house. This is an example of a project on the ADS. It's Pim Allison's um, Roman Military Spaces data. Um, as you can see, there's a, a bunch of different files. You download each of them and you compile them at the other end. The metadata or the documentation that you see here is in PDF form. Um, Pim got to decide how she explained uh, that metadata and you read the report to understand the data. There's been uh, new and more dynamic uh, databases uh, built since then, including the Digital Archaeological Repository um, based at Arizona and that's what we've um, developed our repository on. Um, but my first experience of that was the AHAD project, the Australasian Historical Archaeology uh, Database, um, which has now been superseded. Um, and what we've done is we've rebuilt our repository to include uh, any data from an Australian archaeological site or any archaeological data that an Australian uh, archaeologist creates. Here's a uh, brief glimpse of uh, the repository. We've had some delays in the development. It should have been out in October. Um, January is looking like a more realistic date for public release, but this is um, what we can see at the moment. That's our test site. Everything's organised by project, as most of the repositories are. Uh, so this is the EAMC databases that I explained uh, at the beginning of the, the presentation. I, we released that as a big gigantic access database file. It's now been broken up to get it into the repository. So there's a basic description for the project, and then all that work I did compiling all the data sets, putting them together, I then broke them all up again and split out the ontologies, uh, the coding sheets, the actual data itself and the support material and all of the images. So it's ended up creating a, a many more resources but they're actually more useful in this format. So this is one of the um, data sets. The original form that I uploaded is still there and can be downloaded at any time as I uploaded it, the precise file. There's also a translation of that file um, into an uh, Excel spreadsheet and um, on top of that I've mapped in coding sheets and they're the definitions of the terms and vocabularies that have been used in that data set. So instead of having those as lists in my access database, they're now um, sitting here as coding sheets and each of those has been mapped to an ontology, a hierarchical vocabulary which allows me to do some neat things uh, with the data within this repository. One of the main things that we uh, wanted to achieve was getting the data sets down to an, an artefact level. Uh, TDAR is well known as having uh, the data set as its uh, atomic unit. So it gets you down to the data set and then you uh, manipulate the data set as a whole. We've introduced a few things uh, to make that a little bit easier. One is when you're browsing through a data set, you can then look at an individual artefact, context sheet, whatever your, your uh, row is, and you can see it on a single page. And you can also link um, images to, uh, to those records as well. So you can call up an image of a, a ceramic ware, and you can see all of the detail from the data set. Those two things are then combined, so you can look at each uh, image. The main reason for um, using TDAR is to be able to do data integration and it's very important to have your data sets, your coding sheets and ontologies all lined up. We've got a few bugs in our version of this so um, I'm just showing you an example from the main TDAR site. Uh, these are faunal data sets from Spitalfields in the UK and from Alexandria in the US. You select your data sets, you um, you can see the mapped columns and then you get to go through and choose which particular uh, data you want to look at, which particular class. This is all formal material so it means very little to me. Uh, but you can see here on the right some of those values do exist in the Spitalfields example and not in the Alexandria. You then get an integrated uh, table at the end of that. You can dump that into Excel and do what you will with it. Um, this is a fantastic tool and um, it's a, it's a wonderful way of doing things, but I have to admit it is a lot of work. Um, 
it's time consuming for the depositor, they have to describe all of their uh, metadata carefully, they have to set up their coding sheets and their ontologies. Um, part of the work we've tried to do with FAMES is to automate some of those systems and we've been able to um, automate some of the material that comes across from the mobile device but not all of it, so there's still a little bit of manual work there in the background. The example I just gave you um, works well because there were two teams from Spitalfields and from Alexandria who were working together to get their data mapped um, and that's one of the reasons it, it works well and we still need to do that work, there's no magic solution to that. I'm just also going to talk about a publication service open context that you may know of. Um, this takes a very different view, this is the one page per pot shard model uh, where everything is described down to its um, finite, to a finite level. This is an example of a single shard, as you can see you can click through here to work your way back up the context layers and look at the whole site or the trench. Um, and you can also go down further and not just look at the uh, context but you can click on these subcategories and see quick little visual analyses of your data based on the classifications that are in your system. You can also, of course, uh, take slices of data and export it and again do what you will with it outside of, of open context. Um, one of the reasons this works uh, well, and TDA does some of this as well, is that it's building links between all the different components of the data that we publish and share. So in the old school method, we might just share this bit, the publication at the end, or we might share the report as well, but we need to be sharing all of this data. You can still share it all in the ADS, but it's so much better when we're actually building active links between all of this. So my point, um, my main point, and I'm actually on time, which is so exciting. Um, my main point is that in order to do this really big scale work, we have to be doing really detailed, fine-grained work at the publication and sharing level. It's not just about sharing your data sets and the companion vocabularies. You have to get them all in there, you have to describe them, and you have to do this hard work of mapping your precise terms to somebody else's. So there's quite a few ways that we can do that. Um, as I've said, ADS is a model, uh, TDA is a model, and so is open context. What we're hoping to do with FAMES over the next two years is, first of all, encourage the creation of well-structured mobile data, and uh, Sean and Adela will be talking about that um, next. That will reduce a lot of that effort in terms of ontology mapping. We'd also like to create a shared library of concepts uh, so that some of that mapping can happen at the point at which you select your attribute that mapping's already done for you and you don't need to do it later on in, uh, in the scale. And we also would like to look at um, deploying our own version of open context so that we can have that finer granularity of one page per plot chart so the material can be repackaged and um, reworked in a more flexible manner. So that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, one question? Uh, one. What are you going to let us help get uh, caught up? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Standards so, so, yeah. oh, that's yes. Thanks. We're doing other things with standards and ontologies too. Maybe you'll convince me to talk about it a little in my paper. <laughs> uh, so uh, next, uh, if you'll, sorry, I have trouble talking and flying the computer at the same time, I need to turn this over to Ian Johnson, who is uh, one of our remote uh, presenters who will be uh, presenting a paper, Doing Data Structures Right, From Purist Entities to Fames, Forms, and TDAR Deposit. And uh, Ian, I think uh, you should be able to uh, take the calm. Yes, Ian, you are muted, so unmute yourself. Okay, can you there hear you me go. now? Oh, good. Yes. Do you? Yes, uh, you're, we're all set. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and be fairly fast because I have rather too many slides as usual, um, but I do have a, uh, a timer here. Um, so I'm going to basically... Then I'm going to talk about the FAMES workflow. So I'm going to provide a few general comments about data structures. And this is from my abstract. Um, uh, I think the important point is it is almost always a bad idea to use spreadsheets or database tables. And I'll come back to, 
to what that, which reflects the structure of the source data. I'll come to that in a moment. So the problem is the complexity spiral. It all seems very simple when you start with a spreadsheet describing a set of stuff. So here's a typical spreadsheet. It's not a, an archaeological spreadsheet, but it illustrates very nicely a lot of the problems uh, with using a spreadsheet to describe what appears to be a simple set of stuff. You get, in this case, it's uh, theatrical productions. Uh, one of the problems is there's a lot of contextual spatial information. So that first row, um, in fact, uh, is the, about the 1860s. The second row is about a production and so forth. And if you break this spreadsheet down, you end up with about four entity types and two relationships, uh, which basically define how the, um, the, the production relates to persons and organizations. But the spreadsheet itself has lots of um, uh, standard problems with, uh, with data that isn't very controlled to do with the format of the data, and variable versions of texts, notes appended to fields, and so forth. So this is kind of a worst case. I'm assuming you can all hear properly. I will go on assuming that. Yes, we can. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, it's a bit strange sitting here talking to your computer. Uh, as soon as you start to bring in more entities, you start to push up the complexity substantially. So if you took a look at the Zagara database, uh, it's beginning to be quite complex, lots of different fields, and they are specific to the structure of this particular site. You've got a complicated relational structure um, that links all these tables together. And in order to get any results out of this, and indeed to put any data into it, you start to have to apply a lot of program logic, uh, joining tables together, data entry logic, and so forth. And any structural modifications you make uh, require a lot of further programming, or at least um, uh, work, to, um, uh, to, to adjust to the new data structures. And very often, that requires migrating whole amounts of data from one database to the other, dependency on programmers, cost, and so forth. So it's not a flexible, instant change. Any change tends to be pretty um, pretty costly. Um, if you look at the sort of abstract database structure, uh, this is the structure of Heuristic, in fact, version 2, but 3 is very similar. Um, this structure is always the same for all databases. And these sorts of abstract, what I'm calling abstract databases, go back to the mid-1990s. There was a, a product called IDEA, the Integrated Database for Excavation in Archaeology, I think it was called, um, uh, Del Hus. Um, and they basically allow the databases to adapt easily to local requirements uh, because, in fact, you're storing the structure of the data. Uh, your entity structure is actually being stored as data in the database, and the database itself has a fixed structure. So anything, any changes can be handled by the program rather than being handled by changes to the program. So if you look at both Heurist and the FAMES uh, server, they use very similar designs. Uh, we have records. FAMES has archents, archaeological entities. Uh, they relate to data values in key value pairs. We have terms. They have, uh, FAMES has vocabularies. Um, uh, record structure is the ideal entity structure and so forth. And relationships are slightly different, but basically do the same sort of things, relating different entities to one another. So um, the advantage of these sorts of abstract databases is the structure never chain of the actual database never changes. And um, you can basically uh, change the structure of what you're recording by modeling your data, deciding, deciding what sort of entities you need, and then entering in them as data in the database. So here's an example of the sort of <coughs> entity-based structure. This is uh, the Bali Paintings uh, database. Uh, it's um, basically you decide what's, what uh, unique entities you need to describe and how they connect together. And this one requires about 10 record types and 10 relationships, and or pointers and relationships. And these are actually set up in heuristics fields, so they're very quick to define. So this entire structure, if you already had worked out your model, would probably take an hour or so to, to set up. Uh, so really, the database information becomes trivial uh, because you're not actually setting up a database, a hard-coded database structure in something like MySQL or Access or FileMaker. Here's an example. This is the Zagara database again. Uh, it's just using basically the standard functions of Heurist uh, to provide the data modeling. There's nothing special in here where there's special stuff is to do with output. 
Uh, so uh, you don't need to, in fact, create special functions for different databases. A couple of ex further examples, um, a medieval cookbook. This is the database which took me about 45 minutes to set up. Uh, execution ballads, ballads about executions, um, that I set up and trained somebody to use in a couple of hours. Um, they're, they're all using fairly small numbers of uh, entities connected together by relationships that define roles and so forth. Um, and this one, another one for another historical database. Uh, and because the functions are built in to the database and not programmed specially, you immediately get maps and timelines uh, out of the database. So if you look at a typical archaeological database, it's going to be something, maybe a survey database, an excavation database. I just pulled up these very quickly. But actually, most survey and excavation databases use these sorts of entities and these sorts of relationships. So setting up a database, this is here is setting up a database. Um, you basically just give it a name. You immediately get a default set of uh, record types, which are very commonly used in databases. You can get rid of them if you don't want them. Uh, and then for either those or new, new uh, entity types or record types, you can easily uh, add fields, delete fields, change their repeatability, their requirements, and so forth through the web interface. Now, the idea of that is that we can basically set up a database in a couple of hours. Um, uh, we can then also borrow existing setups, existing record types from a, a repository of other databases. And uh, uh, FAMES is setting up a library of structures uh, which will be available to Heurist users so that they can pull down predefined sets of record types, entities if you like, um, which will very greatly shorten the process of setting up a database. Um, the advantage is you can then modify these, you can grow the data model without having to, um, uh, without affecting existing data. And um, that's a bit of detail I'll skip over. So this is the Flame Frames workflow. You start with Heurist, set up your database um, in Heurist, uh, which, as I've said, may be only a matter of a few hours. Uh, you then export it to the Fame server. And I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, over the next day, or the next hour or two, and tomorrow. And um, uh, uh, this is the, the, the workflow summarized uh, in text, but I will skip over that and work through it. So you export to FAMES. Uh, that sets up the, um, uh, this is the, oops, I don't know how I got that there. Uh, this is the, basically the summary. It's just a few clicks to export your database structure to FAMES. Uh, you then synchronize, uh, the, then uh, FAMES creates the structure for the FAMES database and synchronizes it with Android tablets. Use them in the field, synchronize the data back, go to and fro on that on a daily basis or hourly basis or whatever is required. And then at the end of the field season, typically, or maybe during the course of it, you can pull that data back into Heurist. And in fact, it pulls both the structure and the data back into Heurist with just a few clicks. Uh, then the next stage is uh, to analyze and, and modify, uh, so you can do some recoding and analysis and visualization within Heurist, and then export that structure out to TDAR, uh, which you've just heard about. So uh, basically, it, it, the, the export does most of the work of exporting to TDAR. It gets all the data over, it gets the coding sheets and so on over, but because of limita current limitations in TDAR, we can't automate the process of linking the coding sheets to the tables. That's something which hopefully uh, will be added to TDAR next year. And so here is a database that's been exported from Heurist into TDAR, producing a set of, um, a set of, uh, of, of tables, records, and coding sheets, and so forth. And in fact, I am ahead of time, because I talked extremely fast, just to mention that we've set up a FAMES uh, repository, a schema repository um, uh, in, in Heurist, which will be both accessible through Heurist in order to be able to download schemas, but also accessible uh, to uh, download that information in various forms uh, over the web. So we'll publish the schemas out of Heurist onto the web. And that actually is it. Thank you very much.
I have to thank Ian for uh, for helping us get caught up to, to time after we started a few minutes uh, late. So thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Ian. Uh, do we have any questions now? Mick, yeah. Hi. I just am, I suppose, trying to get my head around all this because, uh, and I think it's a bit of, it's the case that I need to do a bit of unloading uh, traditional database design and so on. Um, the idea of an entity, can you, uh, Ian or Penny or someone, maybe talk about that a little bit more because it seems kind of very different to how I conceptualize databases. Uh, well, I could perhaps use. Perhaps here's an example of the, the, the execution balance because I happened to do that this week. So the initial database that I was working with there was basically a spreadsheet describing these ballads with columns that described the tune that was used, the people, the person or the people who were executed, um, the, uh, the author of the tune and so forth. So each row is a, is, is a sort of complicated set of descriptors of a ballad which involves repetition uh, of, for instance, people, of uh, tunes, of composers. And if you change, see if you, for instance, realize that a particular tune is changed by a particular, com uh, uh, has the wrong composer, you have to go through and change the composer everywhere that that composer appears. Um, and if you wanted to put further information about a composer, such as their date of birth and so forth, um, uh, then you'd have to have another column, and that could get inconsistent. This is the, the, the basis of a, a sort of flat file spreadsheet approach. What you do is you pull that apart and say, I have different entities. So I have the entity of a ballad. I have the entity of a tune. I have the entity of a person who may be the person executed or may, in fact, be a composer. Um, uh, I have a pamphlet describing the ballad. Um, I have the event of execution, and all of these can be linked together. So the person has a role in the event of execution. Uh, the uh, the composer has a role of composer. Uh, the person has a role of composer of a ballad, uh, of a tune, and so forth. Now, taking a more archaeological example, uh, if you have, uh, let's say, a site, a site might be composed of trenches. So you have uh, uh, an entity trench, and the trenches are linked back to the site as being part of the site. Within the trenches, you may have uh, uh, contexts. They're part of a trench, uh, but those contexts can also be linked to a, an artificial concept, for instance, of a phase, which may not actually exist as a physical object, but is another type of entity which can be used to link together all the contexts. And then artifacts will be collected from within contexts so they will be another type of entity linked to contexts as being belonging to that context. I hope that sort of helps to make clear the, what, what is an entity. Typically, it's a, uh, an entity would be a table in a standard relational database uh, described in a particular way. And of course, you get the problem then that you have, uh, you have different types of entities. Artifacts can be all sorts of different things, and they have different sets of attributes. So then you start to run into problems of having columns which don't apply to uh, all of the entities. One of the ex advantages of breaking it down into entities is you can have sub-entities that relate to different types of artifacts, for instance. Yeah, the, the way that we often describe it in the FAMES ecosystem is the entities are your, they're your atomic units of recording. So for an excavation, the most obvious one is like a stratigraphic unit, right? That's an archaeological entity. You may also have, say, an artifact group at, at the excavation level, but then when you, say, switch over to artifact processing, your individual catalog artifact might be your, your entity in that case. It's whatever the sort of smallest, you know, unit of, of recording is. I, I think one of the problems that um, has occurred in the past is because it's been difficult to create 
complex databases, relational databases with lots of different entity types, lots and lots of tables and lots of joins and so forth. People have tended to sort of shy away from it and use very sort of almost use molecules rather than atoms. So the, the advantage of the sort of t systems that FAMES is using, that Hurist is using, is we can start to go right down to the atomic level and really break things down and then put them together in the order we need rather than being constrained by having already predefined things connecting together. So we'd probably better start with the next paper now. I've, I, I, I want to say lots more to make, but I will save it till, uh, uh, till later about how this, and this is part of the transition that Ian has talked about between bespoke databases for every project where, you know, you, you may not have something called an entity, you've got your own, you know, customized terminology to these more generic databases that can be more easily adapted for more projects. Um, so, but to uh, to move on, uh, we'll have we'll try to go. Uh, we're we're on time, and hopefully, if we can stay on time, we'll have to, uh, we'll we'll have a chance for more questions uh, at the end. Uh, but I will now turn things over to Brian, and I think that isn't that what? Uh, yep, I think that's what uh, we want there. And uh, Brian is going to uh, going to be talking to us about flat files. Flat files have always been good enough, an argument for more nuanced data structures. Go. So, hello. I'm presenting from Sydney. Uh, this talk is going to be a little bit more abstract. I'm hoping to make a persuasive case that spreadsheets aren't necessarily the most efficient use of your time. Uh, just, just as a general uh, question to the audience, since I can see the audience, how many of you preferentially use spreadsheets? And uh, raise your hand if you use a spreadsheet for your data collection. And raise your hand if you, you if you've used a database. Okay, so I've managed to convince half of you already. This is good. This is a good and joyful thing. So. When we're talking technology questions, the answer to any single database question ever is it depends. There is no global solution to a database. There's no global answer of how to do it right. It is always contextualized and is always contingent on your situation. Which means that if I ask the question, are databases better than spreadsheets, it depends. Now, for purposes of this discussion, I'm talking about a relational DBMS. I'm talking about something that allows for referential integrity and for uh, powerful queries in, in whatever language, be it SQL or Sparkle or what have you. Um, Graph databases are outside the scope of this talk, but many of the same arguments apply. Also, because I can see the room quite neatly, and I will be doing technical questions, uh, please, if you have a question, just raise your hand and interrupt me. This can be a dialogue. This, needs, this XKCD needs to hang on everyone's wall. Whether it is better to use a database or a spreadsheet is fundamentally a question of time. A database is a horrible proposition if it doesn't actually save you time. Any given data project runs through a number of phases. You've got collection, loading, transformation and doing stuff. And when I, when I say it's a question of scale, the scale has basically four units. You've got never, once, many, and lots. So at one side of the scale, you've got write never, read never, the ultimate in procrastination and the subject of grant applications. Whereas on the other hand, you have write lots, read lots, which is Twitter. And in the middle, for example, write once, read never is bureaucratic paperwork that you submit into the Aether and it's never interacted with. And for any of these scales, 
what the most appropriate tool is changes. Collection, historically, is the hardest and most complex. Now, in the technical world, collection is really easy because the data is really easy. Here, however, this is expert stuff by experts. What does that mean? It means that your entities are encoded judgment calls made quickly by experts. This is not something that you can trivially entrust to a thermocouple or to a camera or to what have you. This is something that actually requires interpretation, which means that collection is where most archaeologists spend the most time because it is a hard problem that they are uniquely qualified to solve. What this means, though, is that loading becomes an afterthought. Spreadsheets are desirable because they are isomorphic to paper. For any given form, a row or two of the spreadsheet contains the data of that form. Which is great if you're not going to be doing much with that data. If the emphasis of your project is on collection and there's no transformation that's going to occur and the doing stuff is a catalog or, or, or simple counts, then yes, use a spreadsheet. It is absolutely 100% appropriate to spend time on the hard stuff and don't spend time automating stuff that you're not going to use. But this is not going to be the case. A case for the database comes down to three questions, scale, reuse, and analytics. Spreadsheets and access does not scale. Spreadsheets do not scale, be with the number of users, the number of records, or the complexity of records, they do not scale. They are really annoying to reuse. Spreadsheet data answers the questions that you designed into it to start with, and repurposing it later is difficult. Analytics. Spreadsheets can be used for analysis, again, if you've thought of the question in the first place. So why is it a question of scale? It's a question of scale because errors cost time. Now, in this database -y world, in this, in this beautiful technical world, there is a great role for the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is great for complex error checking. Donald Norman says that when we're designing user interfaces, we should have the interface prevent errors. So errors should not be possible. If you've ever seen a dialog box prop, pop up, that's a bad interface. The interface should never allow you to wander into error. In the same way, a well-formed data schema prevents errors in your data, which means that you can then have a staging mode of your spreadsheet, and the staging mode of the spreadsheet means that you can check for complex, fiddly errors that you did not anticipate validating before the fact. Is everyone with me? <laughs> Multiple users cost time. Who, who, who can recognize this theme of file names? This is bad. This is so very bad. But when you're exchanging Excel workbooks, or you're exchanging access databases, or you're exchanging dissertations, because everyone knows that when you're exchanging edits with a student, you just copy the file from the attachment, right? Version control has moved beyond email and the file system. And version control scales where email doesn't. The other critical thing here is, you note how there's a lovely progression of final, then final one, then final one, then final one. What happens if Sean and I edit the presentation at the same time? It costs us even more time to integrate those changes. 
And a proper database management system removes this error from the equation. It is not possible in a well-designed database to have these versioning problems because you're not moving the data around. You, everyone is communing to the repository itself. Transformation is optional. So scale is, is scales with us. Scales always with us. But transformation or reuse is optional. For a small archaeological project, which is write once, read once, you're not going to transform it. You're going to compile the spreadsheet, you're going to make your catalog, and then you're going to walk away and no one is ever going to use that data again. The first use is free. This is, this is almost the same sense that the first hit is free. Spreadsheets are seductive with their ease of use. The first time you use them, oh, it's great, it does everything you want. The next time you want to use that data though, oh, well, you just have to do a little bit of editing. It's not too bad. You can stop any time you want to. By the tenth time you redo that spreadsheet, your face is ashen and gray. And yes, the, the, the analogy to drugs is 100% correct because with a spreadsheet, you cannot ask questions of the data that you did not anticipate before meddling with the data. Here's the other problem with a spreadsheet and transformation. Who here has been following the economics news where, where there is a big flap how a graduate student, yes, Sean, <laughs> where, where a graduate student uh, caught an error in this huge economic spreadsheet that used to show that there was an economic discontinuity at 90% uh, debt to GDP ratio. Anyone, anyone follow this? Right, so this huge, huge problem that, that politicians across the world had based their economies on and their austerity measures on because, oh, having too much debt is bad because this study says so, was an Excel error. So people, many thousands of people lost their jobs because of a cell duplication error. How's that for a sobering thought? So when we talk about reuse, a spreadsheet, unlike a database, isn't designed for reuse. A database has a much higher initial cost, but allows for arbitrary questions to be asked uh, in the future by other people. So like I said, there is a case for a database. Scale scales by the number of users. It scales by the number of the amount of data and the complexity of data. And it, it comes down to a very simple question. Does automating your data entry and does automating your analytics save you more time than not? Now, let, let's be let, let's actually think about how to change our minds, right? If, if we're trying to make a persuasive case here, we can't just say, oh, well, we're going to succumb to the sunk cost fallacy. We know how to use uh, spreadsheets, but we, well, at least half of you, admit to not knowing how to use databases. Therefore, when we're thinking about the cost of a database, we include the cost of learning the database in the cost of the database, but we don't include the cost of learning the spreadsheet in the spreadsheet. That's a classic sunk cost fallacy. But I posit to you that even if we admit that sunk cost fallacy, that databases, the more records you have, the better they'll perform. Databases fundamentally have a logarithmic complexity versus the spreadsheets linear. A spreadsheet with 10 records is very, very simple. 
A spreadsheet with 100 records is quite simple. A spreadsheet with 10,000 records is a headache. A database with 10 records is a little complex. A database with 100 records is a little complex. And a database with 10,000 records is a little complex. The complexity of a database grows far more slowly than the complexity of a spreadsheet. When you're worried about errors in your data, when you're worried about data reliability, and when you have to rename lots of fields, databases start showing their advantages. A matter, uh, if, in terms of scale, count how many people are in your project. How many people are going to touch the data, be it read or write or what have you? If it's more than four, use a database. Note, when I say use a database, I'm not talking about access. Because access has the file name problem, where in access you have final, then final one, then final one, BBS, etc. And I'm, I will ask Penny to share the database uh, integration problem that, that she had. Um, that she, uh, okay. Oh, one minute. Okay. Um, so four people, more than four people use a real database. Reuse. Remember, if you plan to reuse your data, or if you think that reusing the data is possible, use a database. And if you want to see what can be done with analytics, look up the story of target and predicting pregnancies. It is astonishing what you can do with well-formulated data. And I encourage you to think big. And finally, for databases, take the right kind of course. Take a course of nor on normalization and data modeling. Actually, programming the database should not be your job and is frankly really easy. Instead, figure, figure out what third normal form is and figure out how to think in third normal form. Because if you can think in third normal form, all of the complexity of a database evaporates. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, we are still reasonably on time. So if uh, there are any questions, we can have one or two now. Mick, yes. Uh, thanks, Brian. First of all, I'd like to kind of back up your uh, comment about the redundancy of spreadsheets in many cases. Uh, a few years ago, I was working for a consultancy uh, organization who basically used an Excel spreadsheet to manage all of their heritage data. Uh, it was served up on a network drive, and one day somebody basically copied out a whole bunch of the data and deleted it. It was never, ever recovered. It was a terrible, terrible example of how poor uh, data spreadsheets are for managing this sort of material. The question I had, though, was uh, can you explain what third normal thinking is, third normal form? Third is? normal form. Um, yes. Can I do it quickly? Oh, isn't this a challenge? Third normal form is a is the well is the most common form of nor data normalization where you split up each table into stuff that relates only to the prime the, the identifier of that table. So imagine that we have a table of pot shirts, right? This, this is something that um, I've, I've been normalizing, well, in, in well, last January I normalized for uh, Adela. Imagine a table of pot shirts. In this table, you have uh, the fabric and the color of each of the sides. So when you're thinking of the pot shirt, the shirt itself is a thing. But the color and the fabric of each side is not a thing that relates to the shirt, but a thing that relates to the side of the shirt that you're touching, right? So exterior is different from interior and so on and so forth. And so third normal form recognizes that this data needs to be in different tables and gives you rules and a methodology for separating, oh, hey, since something can have multiple sides and multiple colors and multiple fabrics and those colors and fabrics are related to a side, we should pull it out and we should make it its own table. 
And when I've been teaching database classes, normalization is always the hard part of the class. We spend a month on normalization. We spend a month saying, here's why it's wrong, here's why it's right. It is, it is the, the, the crunchy nut at the center of databases. It's kind of annoying to, to get. But once you get it, then you can see why a spreadsheet has errors that creep in on little cat feet. And it's a question of authority. What third normal form does is it makes sure that any given fact in the database is stated exactly once, so that when you change or insert or delete that fact, you are changing, inserting, deleting only that fact and nothing that relates on it. Imagine if the car database was a spreadsheet, right? And so if I totaled my car, I would cease to exist because my name is removed from the database just like the car is. It is that kind of anomaly that we are looking to avoid in third normal form. Uh, the, original, uh, the original database uh, text, or EF COD, uh, 1970s, there's lots and lots out there on third normal form, and frankly, I would be happy to teach a class to archaeologists on data normalization. So this is a big topic. There's lots on the internet. Please engage with me on Twitter, but understand what third normal form is so that your data, so that your spreadsheets have less errors that creep in on little cat feet. Yeah, it's. it's I learned these basics when I was a postgraduate student and my department sent me to a database class so that I could build databases for, for use at the, at the academic institution I was at and it took me an intensive six hour class to kind of get my head around this but that's that's about the, but that was also, it was using access so we learned how to use the program access and learned how to normalize data to third normal form. There are lots more normal forms after that, like the database under underlying fames is a sixth normal form database, but you only have to learn the first three. And it come, really boils down to what Brian was saying, that it's really a way to ensure that every piece of data exists once and only once in your database and uh, is sort of independent to the structure of the database. Like the easiest example of this is, um, do you have repeating header rows, color one, color two, color three? If you see that kind of thing, that means your data is not normalized because then if you happen to get that your next pot chart has four colors, you've got to change the structure of the table. You can add a new column as opposed to having those split into two tables where you can just keep adding rows instead of adding a new column if we think in the, you know, a spreadsheet paradigm. But I guess, yeah, it's, this is one of those things that's not, it's not trivial to get your head around, but it is it is possible to learn in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, to echo a Twitter comment about this, um, Russell from um, Diachronic Design uh, has a... Oop. You just muted yourself, Brian. I swear I, I didn't do it. No. <laughs> um, Every non-key attribute must depend on the key and the whole key and nothing but the key, so help me COD. And then <laughs> that, that tweet is, is, is perfect. It, it, it summarizes third normal form perfectly. This is, this, this, From these kinds of database normalizations were developed uh, back in the days when computing power and memory were very, very expensive. And so they, are, they were designed you know, partly for, for NASA space program. You know, send, send a shot to Mariner where you've got the computer on the Mariner probes had vacuum tubes and, uh, and memory cores that look like washers you know, with wires running through them. And you have very, very limited computing resources. So it was really designed to be the most efficient way that you can organize data. And the yeah, ACOD's work on this has held up for decades after that. And it's really, it's really interesting seeing how, uh, how, how he solved the problem. So anyway, we should uh, move on. Could I just make one small, one small comment? Um, it's Ian here. Um, and that is that, of course, with modern database structures such as FAMES and Heurist and various other XML systems, you don't actually need, you need to think this way of separating out the separate entities, but you don't actually need to mess with uh, database tables and relationships and join, in fact, formal normalization. But it is really normalization. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess I find, like Brian was saying, and, and I don't think I'm disagreeing with Ian, that being able to think up to like third normal form, it's a good thing to think with when you're modeling your data to avoid some common pitfalls. Um, and even when we're doing data modeling for fames, which doesn't use this kind of database, it takes a lot of the burden off of you as a user. It's still sort of a good way to think. Uh, it's a good um, system to think with. Uh, so okay, hang on just a second, and I will see if I can recapture the computer here. And I need to do actually my screen share, which seems to have disappeared, even though I thought I had it ready. All right. Yeah, it is here. OK. OK, it's my turn uh, now uh, for uh, to do my uh, presentation, which follows on Brian's uh, and Ian's and Penny's to an extent, and also sets Adela up uh, for hers. Um, a lot of what, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is, uh, is an expectation adjustment uh, that, as, as Ian's alluded to, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, and Brian as well, uh, I, I think that um, deploying one of these uh, more generalized databases like Curist or, the, or, 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 say, the FAMES mobile application is more straightforward in the long run for it for projects of any size than setting up your own uh, bespoke database in, uh, say, a geodatabase in ArcGIS or uh, building your own access database or, um, or, or say, MySQL, Postgres, Postgres, whatever database system, management system that you're, that you're using. But it, it can, we have only so far been able to simplify it to a certain point, and I think that there's only a certain amount of simplification to, to, uh, uh, to data management uh, that is possible. I mean, there are still some, you know, there, there, there are still some parts of data management that require some time and require some, some, some thought, and I want to talk about those in general and also how they relate to uh, um, deployment of the FAME system, particularly the mobile, uh, mobile device um, uh, uh, data capture, which seems to be the thing that a lot of people are interested in, something that we're very excited about. So, uh, so yes, this is a th this um, uh, presentation is very much, I think, a, 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 one that's designed to uh, encourage uh, reasonable expectations. Uh, because we have gotten some emails, some requests saying, okay, I'm out here, I'm ready to start my field work, send me your app so I can start collecting data. And it's, I, I don't, uh, I don't think we can make it that easy. Um, and I, I go back to the stock taking workshop, and we, we, at the beginning of this project, uh, the Nectar project that, that's, that funded our development for the first two years, um, you know, we, we had a we had a six month stock taking phase that a number of you in this room were were, were at, uh, and uh, we did surveys, we did focus groups, uh, we we had a workshop that had working groups on different uh, on, on different aspects of archaeological data recording. We really wanted to find out what archaeologists needed before we started our development, uh, and we've tried to you know keep the community as informed as we can and. Uh, uh, recruit some of you to do user acceptance testing and other things uh, as we've uh, as as we've gone along, but I have up here a few quotations from uh, from the archaeological surface survey working group, uh, where they recognize that that uh, the future of the discipline probably and the profession is probably pointing towards digital um, uh, digital recording, but that. Uh, that any system that was going to be used was going to need to be customizable and 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 flexible because there are you know something that uh, uh, that, that that Robert mentioned you know that there are very few domains of archaeology where there are you know vocabulary standards uh, standardized methodologies etc. I mean there's there there are at least two or three you know different methodologies for instance for surface survey that uh, that produce data sets that are quite incompatible with one another or or quite different. From one another, you may be able to reconcile them in the end, and they require different workflows, different recording systems. Um, so, in in light of this uh, 
uh, feedback that we got right from the beginning of the project, we decided it, it was just it was obvious that we couldn't create a data logger, something that had set fields that if if we wrote a data logger that was based on our surface survey in Bulgaria that uses a very sort of the, the kinds of survey that they do in Mesoamerica and the, and the Mediterranean and in the Middle East, that's very different from the uh, uh, from from the way that many surface surveys in Australia are uh, are, are run. I mean, we use uh, continuous coverage survey units, uh, counts by unit, uh, rather than using a transect and site model. And you know that and these two systems would require very different, or these two approaches would require very different data recording systems in the uh, in the field. So you know, I just use that as an illustrative example that. Uh, the, the building a static data logger was really precluded from the uh, beginning because archaeologists generally don't agree on much of anything and uh, all sort of look at one in and this uh, I, I thought this we all thought this picture from our workshop was uh, great at uh, when we were talking about data standards and could we all agree on 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 you know methodologies and standards that we could share so that we could produce just a series of data loggers a couple of survey ones a couple of excavation ones which was the original idea idea behind the BAMES project, um, but uh, it turned out that we didn't really think that that was a viable solution. So instead, what we did was create a much more customizable platform that essentially the software that runs on your you know, Android device, phone, tablet, uh, whatever you're using, is an interpreter. Uh, you you feed it definition documents and it produces a schema and an interface and the validation and logic and and, and other things that you want um, on your on your device. So it is highly customizable. But the fact that it's customizable means that it re it requires customization. It takes time to uh, to prepare and set this up. And at least now in the initial phases of, of the uh, public release of the project, it's going to likely require support from us because we have not automated everything yet. And in fact, that was the main, that's the main purpose of the LEAF that we applied for now, the, uh, in, the uh, ARC infrastructure grant that we've won to support the project for the next two years is really about getting this software out into archaeologists' hands and providing them with the support that they need to make the transition to a fully digital workflow uh, and, and also to, um, uh, to ease the customization uh, process to help you with, uh, with implementations uh, because the implementations are not, um, uh, you know, that they do require some uh, work. And what I mean by that is, and this uh, relates back to both Ian's and Brian's um, uh, presentation that there's a certain amount before you ever go into the field there's a certain amount of data modeling that you need to do and when I when I took this database class that I mentioned when I was a postgraduate student uh, I mean it was taught by someone who usually worked with small businesses and you know we use the example of kind of an independent bookstore okay you're gonna build a database for that but he, he was telling us stories about his work in the private sector going out to small businesses and modeling their data with them so he could build a database uh, for, for them. And he said that usually you know, he'd get the partners around the table that ran the small business and they'd start talking about their data models and it would force them to reevaluate all of their operational you know, procedures that they used and how they thought about the, that data models are very much embedded in your practice, in your methods uh, that, that, that you use and, and, they, and it can be very it can it can dramatically affect the kind of research that you're uh, uh, that you're doing, the kind of work that you're doing. And I'll just give you one example from one of the earliest test deployments that we did uh, of the Fame system, which was it for an architectural survey of late Inca and early colonial architecture in the high Andes. Uh, the idea that you know this is just a very simple example. They were recording structures right uh, in the in the Andes. Um, and the way that they were doing their recording was they had a structure and associated with that structure were, do do were walls, doors, windows, and niches. And all of those things were kind of in a big bag called a structure. Um, and so doors weren't related to walls, windows weren't related to walls, niches weren't related to windows. You know, there was no relationships between any of these items. They were just all put in a big bag called structure. Um, we were recommend, and they were doing that in an ArcGIS Geo database using ArcPad in the in the field. We recommended instead that they do something like that: you've got a structure, and a, con a structure contains walls, and then doors, windows, and niches are attached to walls. So that way, you could 
it was a little bit more complicated, but then you could do analyses like, what direction do most windows face if you had the direction information about the wall, which they, it, and, and how many, how often does a, a door and a window occur in the same wall? There, there's sort of more complex analysis you can do at the end, um, and there might be other ways even of modeling this data where you have a wall as your, um, and oh, in these first two cases, the structure in the fame system would be the archaeological entity the, the, uh, that you have, and then it has sort of attributes attached to it. Whoops. Um, but uh, there might even be other ways of doing it, but I see I'm already behind, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just say that uh, with these, with the data modeling, how you model your data affects later what you can do as far as analysis goes, and there are sometimes trade-offs between how fast can you report it in the field and, you know, what kind of pow analytical power does the does your data model have at the end, and we're trying to reconcile those through as much automation as we can. So, but to, it, that's the conceptual step, the stage of deploying a system like uh, uh, like like the Fames Mobile system. Um, then there's the actual customization itself, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned, the mobile application is an interpreter. You feed it a series of four documents. Uh, this looks complicated. Adela said, "Don't use that slide; you'll scare everybody away." Uh, but there are actually advantages to having all of having the um, uh, 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 having the uh, the way that the mobile application performs uh, de determined by a series of text files, and the biggest one of those is redeployment. That you can take these text files and you can feed them into any instance of the fame, uh, of the Fames application, and it will produce your 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 mobile data collection system, including all the automation and everything. Uh, and you can use online tools like GitHub to put these up, up like say an ex somebody does an excavation module, then you can grab that excavation module and either reuse it as it is or make slight changes and then, you know, repost it to, uh, it, you can then, you know, publish your, uh, uh, def your, your definition documents online uh, so that other people can reuse it and you can, it's, uh, it, 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 redeployment and reuse becomes very, uh, uh, com becomes simple because all of these definition documents are just text documents. Um, that can be edited that way. But it does take a certain amount of time to create them. We're working now, and one of the main, um, uh, the main focus of, uh, of the next couple of years will be to speed the, uh, the deployment of our, uh, of our applications. So as I was mentioning, you can reuse off-the-shelf uh, excavations. You can use, as Ian uh, alluded, uh, referred to, uh, Heurist can be used to build these modules, so you don't have to write the schema and uh, you, you don't have to learn XML and write the, you know, the schemata and the interfaces by hand. You can use Heurist to uh, develop those. Uh, you can write your own. Um, and right now, we can we using Heurist, we can automate pretty much everything except for the the logic, the thing that does your validation, uh, your um, um, uh, 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 say duplicating records, automating things. That's the only part that still has to be done by hand, and that's what we are providing support for this year. Uh, so, and we're we're looking to automate that uh, in the in the future. So, you know, after you so you've conceptualized it, you've done your data modeling, you've done your customization, then you've actually got to deploy it uh, in, in the field. Uh, the application itself it lives on Google Play. That's fine. You just download that. But you need to sync your. We're assuming that most projects will have multiple teams, multiple participants. You need to sync across multiple devices. So we have a server that you use that can sync an arbitrary number of devices with one another. Um, you can either run your own local server if you're going to be in a remote location or you just want that level of control, or you can hit an on if you have internet connectivity at your at your archaeological base, you can use an online server that we can configure and manage for you. And in fact, uh, this week we've got a first trial of it. Uh, the New Zealand Geological Survey is going to use this system for is tri is trialing this system for a soil geochemistry project in New Zealand and they don't want to run, they've got teams all over the country so they don't want to have a bunch of different servers so we're setting up an online server that they can all use to sync their devices no matter where they're working in New Zealand and they may have as many as 20 teams uh, out uh, doing that so uh, uh, but there's again a certain amount of deployment uh, here so um, what's my time Adela is three minutes left okay um, so this may, this may seem like a lot of trouble. We think we can make a convincing case of why it's worthwhile 
And Brian's already talked about some of the reasons why you might want to use a more robust database instead of uh, instead of using you know, spreadsheets or local say, access database, FileMaker database. Ian's talked about you know in the long run and on large scales why generic databases might be might be better. And I'll just add a couple of might be. Uh, better for many circumstances, and I'll maybe uh, and I'll talk. Uh, I'll speak to a few of those points here. First, using this system, you get robust structured data that can be reused, repurposed. That you can ask questions of, and other people can ask questions of that you may not have thought of when you were actually collecting the data. Um, so reusability, well, the the uh, the ability to um, to capture data in a way that allows you to do sophisticated analyses and then for others to, to repurpose that data for their own analyses in, say, uh, regional or other synthetic uh, uh, research projects is, uh, one, of the, is one of the main uh, goals that we, that we have. We want to combine that with you know, robust uh, GIS and multimedia. Adela will talk about this more, uh, but the capacity to, uh, to have a robust GIS system on your uh, on your mobile device, and also to manage multimedia, photographs, video, audio, those sorts of things, to bring pull those features uh, together, and have the path to a resilient online archive, uh, you know, either through uh, a, a, a web application for editing, Curist, or directly from the mobile uh, application going into the repository that Penny uh, that Penny mentioned. So, I mean, basically, what we were trying to ah, and one last that. We're also we have um, uh, built in a system for um, uh, for mapping data to different data sets to one another. Penny alluded to this. Uh, it's based on the way that websites are internationalized, meaning that you you go hit the Google website if you're coming if your IP address says you're from Spain, it's going to be in Spanish or from South America, it'll be in Spanish. If you if it says you're from Australia, it'll be in English. We use a similar sort of approach to allow uh, uh, substitution of uh, of terms, and this can be used for languages. This Andes module needed to be deployed in both English and Spanish, so okay, it'll do that. It can also be used to map your local content, your local terms that you use on your project to core concepts. So to give you a very simple example, you may call a stratigraphic unit a spit, a context, a locus, a, an excavation unit, whatever. We can map that back to a core concept stratigraphic unit and, and, and make different data sets more compatible by reconciling their vocabularies. So I mean, basically, what we wanted to do was pull together in this system a series the, the the features that were the most useful for archaeologists we, uh, the robust structured data GIS and multimedia capability the ability to produce uh, more compatible data sets and we think that this package of features makes it worthwhile to put up with the the uh, initial trial of, uh, of, of of actually customizing and deploying the system so if anyone's interested in using um, uh, in using our system plan ahead prepare your paper forms get ready to switch to in, in preparation to switching to a digital workflow prepare your paper forms um, Face-to-face -face data modeling with us is often is often quite uh, quite useful. Or with if you have data, a database support at your organization, that's great. Uh, that's great too. Right now, it takes us two to five days to produce a module. If we are producing a module for you, depending on the complexity of it, um, and uh, we we have to give pro when we're supporting field deployments, we we're giving priority to our uh, uh, ARC Leaf, our infrastructure partners, the institutions who threw money at us uh, when we were applying for the LEAF, um, so there may be a wait time, uh, but we, we are looking to support some you know, other, other projects. Uh, so, and what we found, like with the Andes, deploying the Andes module, uh, was that good communication. It was very difficult because they were up in the high Andes and only had internet once a week, um, and so it was quite difficult for us to respond to them. So we're really looking. We're looking for projects right now where we can uh, uh, where where we can keep up good communications. So we encourage you to contact us if you are uh, if you are interested in learning more about the system. So that's my presentation, and I've gone over. I don't think we have time for questions. So I will immediately turn things over to Adela, whose, pro whose presentation is quite closely related to mine, so hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end then. And let me switch you. Oops. Okay. 
No. Okay, that's not good. All right, you can pull yours up. Oh, right. while you're doing that, I will. Adele is going to, uh, inspired by a question asked at the AAA last year about what's the difference between what, aren't you just recreating uh, ArcPad? Um, Adele is uh, going to talk about uh, some of the similarities and differences between our strengths, comparative strengths and weaknesses between what we are doing and ArcPad, which is likely the system that, you're, that many of you are most familiar with. So I'm just having a little bit of a difficulty. Can I help you? Will you? I'm trying to get the screen share. Uh, Brian, Ian, can you actually see the presentation? Okay, thank you. So thank you all for your patience and staying with us uh, through this entire session. And I will try to do a um, decent job in covering the bridge between us and the lunch. And as Sean said, um, I will be trying to answer the question that was so pointedly asked last year, which was, aren't you just reinventing ArcPad? And how is it different? And I will try to give you the perspective from the FAMES team uh, on the ways in which we go above and beyond what ArcPad and ArcGIS is um, providing. Let me see, I'm not trying to hear this. So uh, I assume that most of the people here in the audience know what ArcGIS and ArcPad is, mainly because in our famous digital data survey, 60% of people reported the use of geodatabases and some sort of GIS software. Uh, just to give you uh, uh, what ArcPad claims to be itself, it's a mobile field recording and data collection software designed for GIS professionals. It includes advanced GIS and GPS capabilities for capturing, editing, and displaying geographic information quickly and efficiently. Uh, ArcPad is a child, it's kind of a, it's a mobile component of ArcGIS. So when you want to use this component, you actually need to have ArcGIS on your desktop and design your data structures in it. So you would uh, think about what, your, what data you want to collect and what uh, best shape or spatial representations can you assign to your data and you create little containers for them, either a geodatabase or shape files, depending again what best suits your workflow. Uh, you have the choice of three shapes, which is points, lines, and polygons that uh, appear as feature classes in your geodatabases. And again, you need to decide whether you're, you're collecting your lithics as points or whether you're collecting sites as points or polygons and make the decision a priori because uh, ArcGIS keeps these uh, feature classes quite separate. Um, when you are, um, and how the recording proceeds, you first designate your shape and then you attach data to it. You have some flexibility or flexibility, you have some control over how you want to collect your data uh, in terms of do you want, do you need controlled vocabularies, coded values, etc. Uh, again, if you use a geodatabase, you can use the domains in ArcGIS to define specifically what vocabularies you want to use and you want your field workers to use. Um, ArcPad then gives you the option of either uh, recording all of this data in what looks like a little spreadsheet on your device, or if you can write Visual Basic, you can do more complicated customizations and deploy some logic. Um, the main difference between ArcPad and the FAMES app uh, from if I were just asked the question at 2 a.m., I would say ArcGIS and ArcPad are map-centric and geometry-driven recording applications, which means that um, when you get your device, the first thing you will see is a map. You first tap on it, you draw your shape, and only then you can attach your data. This may work for you perfectly fine if you are recording a small lithic, but let's say if you're facing a survey of a large site and you need to, in order to record a site, you need to know its boundary, you may need to walk a couple of miles before you can close your polygon and, and finish that record. So it again depends on what it is you're working on. Um, ArcPad otherwise works on Windows mobile devices and the 
you need to transfer your data between your desktop and the mobile device on you know daily or weekly basis depending where you do and how often you uh, do, do this process by checking the data in and out of your geo database so there is a there is there is a synchronization process or checking well exporting the data in and out which used to be very painful but I just returned from the field with ArcPad 10.0 and I was fairly surprised how much easier uh, it is at the moment. Um, so the potential issues be besides just you know this geometry driven recording not being your style um, the other issues that we have faced in the field, for example, was that recording burial mounds in Bulgaria, I like to have not only a point for each mount, but also a polygon, because I can do different analyses on polygons and points. And this has required me to do duplicate records in the field in order to populate two different tables in the ArcGIS database. And then there are other issues, like what if your students delete some of your data? Um, basically, once you close the program, you can never get it back unless you're very diligent and doing backups every night. So there are some of these hooks and problems that ArcGIS had. Um, but moving to the famous mobile application, I have adjusted blurb and uh, try to say what what we are doing for um, archaeologists and, and uh, field recording. So famous mobile application is. Uh, a mobile field recording and data collection software designed for archaeological professionals. It allows for flexible combination of advanced GIS, structured data, and multimedia collection. All of the data synchronizes automatically across all collecting devices whenever they have connectivity online or via a local server. Um, as Sean had already described, it is an interpreter-based package, and I'm not going to spend any more time here. The main point and the main difference between the famous mobile application and ArcPad, um, e or even QGIS mobile app, uh, is that you can decide what you want your data recording to center on. Do you need geometry? Do you need geometry to drive your recording? We can do that. You can. We have a GIS engine, we have spatialized extension to the database that lets you to create and edit point lines and polygons. You can import and visualize raster data and existing vector data. You can measure and query your data. You can connect a GPS device of your choice. Um, we have modeled this uh, GIS capability slightly on ArcPath and existing devices to provide archaeologists with some familiarity to bridge to this new application. Um, uh, when you are doing your spatial recording, you can choose what your workflow is. Do you need a map? Or um, do you just like in the screenshot here, do you start collecting your structure data and then just want to push a button and say, you know, take me a point here? Uh, you can adjust at which point of your workflow you need to collect your spatial data. Um, do you, um, so you can collect geometry first or last, whatever suits you best. Do you need to collect one or multiple geometries per record? That is not a problem. We can attach multiple shapes to your structured record, uh, as many as you wish. And if, again, you just need to define it. If you need mathematically constrained shapes, such as I'm standing on the top of the mount and it's 25 meters in diameter, the application can draw it for you. Uh, and likewise, it's been mentioned before, we supply for logic and validation. If you need to have a constrained workflow where some people need to answer a certain question before they can move on to another. No, slides, we of course allow for, um, one thing that I wanted to illustrate here is we are working on a touch screen which is slightly different from the Windows mobile devices that ArcPad uses. So you need to get used to tapping with your finger on the screen. And we are using a paradigm that exists for GIS Pro on Mac devices, which means that when you're editing things, you can use your fingers to zoom in and out and move the background around in order to zoom your point to where you want it. So those who um, have signed up for tomorrow's workshop, you can experiment with this new um, interface. Now, that, is, that was for the people who really like their geometry and consider geometry central to their archaeological recording. Some people may not need that aspect um, of recording to their data. Maybe you really need structured data. Uh, and in that case, 
um, the FEMS mobile application, as Brian had pointed out um, and shown, uh, we accommodate hierarchical data and relationships, which are currently fairly difficult to get through in ArcPad or even ArcGIS. So you can have related tables, and as you can see, this is one of the screenshots from the Andes module, where at the bottom of the screen, we are spawning new forms when we need to add a wall to a structure or add a corner to a structure. And you are basically adding related records to your uh, basic entity. Uh, besides this sort of relational data, we also allow you to connect, collect uh, structured data uh, such as drop downs, radio buttons, and check boxes, and for example, picture dictionaries, where you can allow your students and field workers to make selection on the basis not of words, but specific examples that you supply us in these little illustrations. And finally, uh, maybe you are doing research on archives or collecting ethnographic data or uh, collecting oral histories and traditions, and you care only about making a video record or um, multimedia record or uh, collect audio, and then you need to attach some metadata or data about it. So again, we can structure the workflow around that type of data we are recording. And we allow the attaching of just about any possible file. So again, you just need to ask. Uh, besides some of these particular features, there are some intrinsic uh, capabilities that our app has, um, such as each field that is predefined as a controlled vocabulary or is a, uh, some kind of um, um, drop down or a numeric field uh, may provide an annotation with it where, uh, like in the picture provided on the bottom, you can see a bit of a picture dictionary. Um, if you have provided, let's say, 10 types of masonry and your students in the field have found a different type, they have this annotation box to open it and type in, oh, you have one picture missing or we have found a new type of masonry, add another type here. And uh, this is a digital way of scribbling on the margins that comes uh, by default with most of our uh, more constrained uh, attributes. Uh, here is a visual example of what Sean talked about, which is this translation capability in our app where you can produce uh, interfaces uh, customized to whoever is using it um, in terms of the different languages. This is the Andes module, which has to be both in English and in Spanish. So we produced uh, two versions of a famous properties document where there were just there was an English and a Spanish version, and, and the person who was actually building the device could choose which one they wanted. Uh, among the other um, capabilities, uh, with the one that I enjoy the most in the last couple of months is the easy synchronization with the online, with the cloud server or a local server. Now finally, this app, by pushing a single button on the right screen which says start syncing, and then observing a nice green spot on the top of the bar, you can just go take a nap and the app does all the work for you. It is wonderful. Um, I have just returned from field work in Greece and that was the, my most favorite feature in the app because we did have good internet uh, and so with the Wi-Fi coverage I could sync just from about anywhere. And Sean has explained some of the uh, background of how, how this works. But I had an online server set up, and just by a pushing single button, all of the data was there. Brian could look at it from Sydney, and we could jointly debug anything or merge and edit as we wanted. Um, the one very wanted feature that our stock taking participants mentioned was the versioning. Uh, the possibility to um, record every change ever done to your record and roll it back. So we have finally made that happen as well, and this is what it looks like on the server. Um, the, basically, the first line that is in a red um, boundary is your current record, and every pink square um, represents a change that was done you know, in the in the last, during the last editing. So you can this way go through and see who, when uh, has changed what. And if you need to roll it back, you just push the button next to it and you can easily uh, recuperate all your pre-existing edits. 
And finally, all of this works fully offline. So just a couple of words that um, are now. I try to run a little comparison between ArcPad and the famous app when I was in Greece in September and October 2013. Uh, this was my guinea pig, uh, Petra uh, Yanokoas, a uh, graduate student from the Czech Republic, who I just threw some of these devices at, and I told her, go record me this site and that site. And she was wonderful because she didn't know anything about the famous app, and she was just really checking for the intuitiveness and everything. Um, and I compiled some of these um, comparisons. It's a strength and strength and weakness and opportunity and threat analysis that was um, in a sensible field computing article by Wak uh, Tindong and Dejeve, which is a, an interesting. Uh, article on comparing paper and digital recording. I did more you know, ArcPad versus fame, so digital and digital recording. But I was interested in seeing you know, where do I save most time, what are the biggest differences between these two platforms. Um, and the stars basically represent, you know, is there a positive impact, is there a potential for major change to my uh, field process and, um, and um, field operation. And as you can see, there is not much change in the preparation stage. Both systems were digital, so I had to do the same, you know, vectorize all my data, prepare the rasters, that was pretty much the same. But in execution, the mobile application was much better because I was collecting spatial data, structured data, all my pictures and multimedia on the same device. I didn't have to pull out camera, keep a photo log and then you know synchronize the arc pad and and upload all the images and relabel all the images all of that was done automatically for me in the app so that was a wonderful help and uh, you know I, I had much faster outputs for the same resources that I invested again in the field post processing um, it was very simple with the same sub but I have also noticed that the arc pad has gotten simpler so that's why there are not that many stars in that field. And in terms of intelligence, um, so far we only have that's based on our re most recent export, which is the CSV. Now that is the same. If you import your data into ArcGIS, you get a, an exported as a CSV. There is basically um, you, you get the same output from our app as well. So um, some potential, but you know not that much more. Uh, and again, in terms of organization of your fieldwork, uh, again in the execution part. Uh, you get the greatest benefit because the application is so structured that you can pretty much throw it at anyone and they can hardly make mistakes. And it is very intuitive to use once you have it on your mobile device. So that's where I was seeing the greatest advantage of using it. Um, so in, to summarize all of this, um, you will really enjoy the famous mobile application if you design your data properly. Uh, then in the execution and in the post-processing stage, it will pay back greatly. Uh, just uh, the wonders of having all of your multi-dimensional data all in one application in your hand and having the flexible workflow, uh, those are just wonderful. Uh, and as Sean mentioned, uh, currently the mobile application is about is customizable by you, that is normal people and me, because I also don't do the programming up to about 75%, and then the remaining 25 we give to Brian and he fixes it. Um, and as, uh, as far as some weaknesses and considerations that you still need to keep in mind, uh, those are we do not have ArcGIS. This is just a data collector, um, a data collecting app. So we do not have a robust visualization desktop environment that we could offer you for free to replace your ArcGIS license at the moment. You still need to export the data into ArcGIS if you need to do your analysis, but we will try to work something out with our leave. Uh, and other um, shortcomings, you still need GIS skills if you want to do geospatial recording with this app, and you need to think even more than before about how you structure and collect your data, because our app gives you much more flexibility. So you will have many more decisions to make. And finally, you may need to acquire a few more technical skills, such as maybe consider installing Linux if you want to have control in your hands over your data. Uh, maybe look at Huris and see whether you're comfortable with it and learn uh, how to use our mobile application, um, how to use the interface. 
And for those who are um, here to tackle some of this last point, I'll be looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adela. And I realize we're eating into uh, uh, two minutes into your lunch uh, uh, break now. If anyone wants to stay and ask us any questions, we'll be here. And uh, we're happy to continue this uh, conversation over, uh, over lunch uh, as well. Uh, but uh, I'd like to just thank all of our participants, uh, both in real life and uh, remotely uh, uh, here. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Brian.